Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon, and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University, and welcome to Vlog 269, the next instalment in our Rescue Yourself series, yes? What's our title? Words. Words that harm, obscure, and transform. And this vlog is dedicated to Kelly and everybody out there who is challenging themselves to transform how they think about themselves and how they think about their research. And there's no doubt if we described other people with the words that we use to describe ourselves, we'd be living in human resource departments <laughs> around the world most of the time. So think about the words that you use to describe yourself quite frequently. Everyone's list is different, but you know, is stupid there, moron, imposter, embarrassing, ugly. What are your words? What are your words that you use to describe yourself? And then also think about the words we need to describe and activate our research, epistemology, methodology, ontology. And how often do you take some very complicated ideas, render them simple so you learn them, so you understand them, but don't quite transform to the words and the vocabulary you require to deliver that concept at standard. Am I talking about you? Yeah. So today I want to talk about words. Words that we can use to transform yourself, but also words that we can use to transform your research. So part of the inspiration of the log today comes from Kelly. Part of it also comes from a great book I read this week from Sharon Klinger. And the book was titled Power Words. Interesting, Power Words. And she argues that words are a gift that we give to ourselves. And words are a gift that we give to research. So words trigger action. But words also move you between emotional states. Words can destroy us. I'm sure most of us remember, even in childhood, how it felt when a particular word was stuck onto us, a particular word was applied to us, and that word stayed with us, and that word became a scar that we carry through our daily life to this day. So the language every day that we use constructs the life that you live and it also limits who you are and limits the research that you could create. Words hold meaning because they summon images, they summon experiences and they also activate sensory experiences and ideas. Words activate meaning. Very easy thing to say, that words activate meaning, yeah, or obviously. But think about the different meanings or interpretations we activate when I use two different words. Only one word is changed in this sentence. What do you think? What do you think? Let's change one word. What do you imagine? What do you imagine? We've changed one word, see how the meaning transforms radically. So this vlog is going to move around and we're going to look at words. Words and their relationship to you. And words and their relationship with your research. So yes, we're looking at how words manage your emotional life. We're also exploring how words summon action. Five strategies. Strategy one, let's do this. One, let's talk about words of cruelty. I remain on a daily basis absolutely horrified with the language that students use to describe themselves. Now, I hear students just about every day describe themselves as stupid, describe themselves as an idiot. Are you one of those people? Let's talk about it. Now, can we make a deal between us in this Rescue Yourself series that you stop 
using these words to describe yourself. So let's list some words. Stupid, idiot, moron, incompetent. Let's stop using those words to describe yourself. But can I also ask that we stop using those words to describe other people as well? So stop yourself. And let's make a decision today to stop the deployment of words that do harm. If we're going to rescue ourselves, then the first step in that journey is to demonstrate compassion for yourself. And this means you're going to provide yourself a space to grow beyond a label. See, if you call yourself stupid, if you call yourself a moron, then you've set the bar for yourself pretty damn low. What you're doing with words like stupid or idiot is you're putting a fence around your ability. So let's cut these words out of our vocabulary. Let's stop the self-loathing. Let's make a decision to stop the self-loathing. And let me tell you why this is so important, particularly in a PhD program. Because words have power. Now we know that, that's a cliche. Words have power. But the power from words comes from the experiences that we associate with them. And these experiences of these words have emerged in context. So we need to think about words in context. Let me give you an example. Say I use the word fire, you know, in the context of a barbecue. Let's fire up the barbecue. Let's fire up that barbecue. Yeah. And you go, food. Yeah. Let's fire up the barbecue. If I say the same word, fire, in the context of a laboratory, like team, fire, lab, fire, fire, you'll have a different response to that same word. So the problem is that specific words are used repeatedly and they're used out of habit. And as we all know, I think, when we repeat something often enough, what repetition does is it situates something into our memory. And the problem is that word goes into our memory, but so does the emotional state come along with it. So let me just show you at its most simple how this repetition uh, works in your memory. Okay, you ready? What's five times five? What's seven times six? What's two times three? Wow, all that learning of our times table when we were kids really, really did well, didn't it? Because, of course, how did we learn it? We learnt it through repetition and it stayed with us. But if I asked you another question, uh, what was the date of the Battle of Gay Pa? Now, it's 1864. But have you ever heard of the Battle of Gay Pa? Well, you wouldn't have if you haven't studied Māori or Aotearoa New Zealand history. Right? So as you can see, repetition matters a great deal. Repetition works. And why all of this matters is a recent study from the University of California, Santa Barbara, showed, and hang on to yourself, this is unbelievable actually, a weak message that is repeated twice has more validity than a strong message that is only stated once. That changed my life. That study that I read this week changed my life. So what this means is repetition increases the validity of what we are exposed to. It's not true. It's not truth. But the repetition gives it credibility. So let's apply this to you. How often are you describing yourself as a bit simple, a bit of an idiot, a bit of a moron, stupid? How often are you describing yourself as that? So every time you're doing that, the repetition is rendering it true. It's not true, but the repetition is rendering it true for you. So you wouldn't call me stupid. You might. Blessed. You wouldn't call me stupid. So why would you call yourself stupid? So 
Kindness matters. And the kindness this week, today, now, starts when we stop the repetition of abuse. To yourself, to everyone else. Two, use words for actions and words for decisions. Thoughts and words we often think align like a horse and a carriage. It's often assumed though that our thoughts are completely internal and our words are completely external. But the words that we summon out of our mouths engage in a very odd dance with our thoughts. Now, we don't say everything that we think, thankfully, but we do edit our thoughts. And those edits tell us a lot about who we are. So I'm not talking about positive and negative thinking. Oh my goodness me, have I read some stuff about positive and negative thinking this week? Wow, yeah, nah. Not talking about that. That binarized thinking is not terribly helpful, I would argue. And if you think about it, what I'm interested in is how we edit our thoughts into words and how we edit our thoughts to summon particular words and phrases over others. So, as we know, it's the repetition of these words and phrases that are so challenging to manage. Think about, for example, how you handle a rejection of an article from a journal. How you handle that email arrives, how you feel at that point. Now, how often do you activate slippage from rejection of an article in a journal to a rejection of you as a researcher? How often do you displace that rejection from just a piece of work, everyone has rejections, piece of work, to a rejection of you as a scholar? Okay, now you think about it, if you're repeating this over and over again, rejection, 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 then your sense of yourself as a researcher is going to be completely hammered. But what we need to try and do if we can is create the separation between the narratives of the research and the narratives of the researcher. That space is meaningful. So that rejection of that research, fine, has absolutely nothing to do with us as a researcher. A piece of work has had a bit of a troubled path through refereeing, big deal, happens all the time. No commentary on us as a scholar. No commentary on us as a scholar, that research Let's work hard and improve it. So as you can see, words determine our approach to an issue or a problem. And of course, they can enable or truncate your decision making. So part of what I'm arguing today, team, is that we start to use these really active words. Active words. So these words remind you to activate, to be active, and to transform your thinking, rather than allowing words to continually limit your actions. So how can you change your language to enable activity? Firstly, you define your purpose. What are you trying to do here? What's the aim? What's the goal? And you don't just think it, you express it, you put it into language, you write it down, you get it in a really functional form, and then you repeat it. What's the goal? What's the aim? What are we trying to achieve? Now, change the word, this changed my life, by the way, change the word plan to approach. Change the word plan to approach. I used to have lots of plans. Now it's just like, no, I'm approaching this matter. I'm, I'm approaching. What's my approach? I'm not planning. What's my approach to this goal? changed everything. And also speak in the present tense. This changes everybody's life, really. Uh, I am writing. I, I am reading. I am researching. Rather than gonna, coulda, shoulda, I'm gonna get to that, really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to that, are you? I am writing. Boom. So as you can see, words matter. And these words summon and move around intellectual furniture, and they also summon your intellectual future. So you set yourself up, use the words that set yourself up for action and for a decision. 
I always remember Alexander Woolcott stated, quote, there's no such thing in anyone's life as an unimportant day. Now, as I've been in managerial jobs for the last 10, 12, 15 years, that sentence has helped me a lot because often when I'm looking at my schedule, like we all do in Microsoft Calendar, oh, there's a meeting and there's another meeting and wow, there's another meeting and wow, yep. And you can sort of just get into the habit of, I'll just move through these meetings. Actually, no, 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 no. Every minute of every day, every day is important. Every minute is important. There is no such thing as an unimportant day. Yeah. So block yourself from this all or nothing teaching. I'm a genius. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Stop the binarized thinking. Three, use words to trigger a change in your behavior. Now, I know the word trigger is a bit triggering at the moment. By the way, I believe in how trigger warning is being used at the moment. I do. I, that's, that's respectful for people's journeys and lives that you can't know about. But I use trigger in a different way. I have trigger words that I associate with transforming my behavior. <laughs> and I use particular words that refocus me. So get me to focus on the issue at hand and change my behavior. Now, I've often, as I move through the day and I feel myself drifting a bit, like I'm in a meeting and oh, um, so if I feel myself drifting a bit, I stop myself and I have a trigger word that I do repetitively, memory, because I want to change my behavior. And that word is lift, 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 come on, lift. Now, sometimes you've actually heard me even do one of those lifts. Uh, <laughs> in a vlog, right? And the reason I use that in such a way, lift, 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 is because I'm trying to stop myself from drifting. Bring myself back. Come on, come on, refocus. So what I'm doing is I'm lifting my expectations. I'm lifting my focus on particular achievements and goals and see if you can find a word that works for you. There's sort of days you sort of... Find a word that when you feel yourself drifting, you cut that word in and it changes your behavior. So a word can get you, and all of us, us, out of inertia. So I use the word privilege a lot. And I use it for a reason. Uh, in higher education at the moment, there's a lot of negativity, a lot of bad stuff going on. Wow, you know. And so when I'm hearing all of this stuff, you'll often hear me reply with, it is a privilege to work in higher education. It is a privilege to work in higher education. And I use that word to remind people with all the terrible things that happen in international higher education, it is a privilege to dedicate one's life to teaching, learning and research. That's a privilege. And that word transforms our behavior. I also use the phrase a lot, intellectual generosity or being intellectually generous, because that reminds me, those that phrase, activates behavior. So when all the jealousy and weird stuff and all this nonsense occurs, all the competitiveness, me, 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 let's talk about me, all that stuff happens. I say, let's take a breath now and let's be intellectually generous. So that means we get out of ourselves. We move from me to we. So you see how these phrases work. And I'm a big fan of changing tenses. I use it a lot. So when people use phrases, oh, I can't, I can't do that, I don't do that, I won't do that, can't do that, can't do that. What I do is I change my language and I change it to, look, I haven't done that before, but you know what? I'm going to give it a red hot go. Let's have a go. Let's do this. Come on. Let's do this. Come on. Right. Or when, you know, a bit of software or something, I just don't quite understand what's going on. I'll say, look, I haven't done this before, but I'm going to learn how to do it now. And when someone, and how wonderful this is, when someone takes the time and teaches you how to do something, I always say, thank you so much. I didn't know how to do that. I know how to do that now. You've changed my thinking. See how the language alters. So therefore, by changing tenses, we move from a denial culture to a learning culture. Four, words for clarity and research precision. When I used to teach first years, and you know, the greatest privilege of my life, as I always say, is being a Dean of Graduate Research, but the greatest privilege of my life also 
was teaching first year students. That's the most important job anyone at a university can do. And I taught first year students for over 20 years. Many of the people watching this vlog, hello, you had to put up with me once a week in your first year. And as many of you remember, <laughs> I used to use the first lecture in first year basically to destroy people's lives. No, I'm joking. I basically used the first lecture to radically and quickly shatter the expectations of students. So, of course, in the old days, students who did well at school were the ones who made it to university. Now, thankfully, we have a much greater diversity of students. But in the old days, they were mostly crew that did well at school and then they came to university and they arrived thinking they were going to do really well at university because university is just like school. Nah. So I wanted them in that first lecture to have the shock of their lives and also lift, lift, lift. I also wanted to really disturb what they thought their expectations of higher education would be. So in that first lecture, I would put up a PowerPoint slide, or indeed, I'm that old, an overhead transparency. Remember those? And I would do a list of, and it would have a heading, banned words. Banned words. And so I banned first year students from using a series of words, and they varied from society, culture, the masses, globalization, mass media. The media reflects society, does it? People, representation, society, stereotype, political correctness. Some of my best friends are gay, lesbian, bisexual or black. Or indeed, some of my best friends are Taylor Swift fans. So I would ban these words and these phrases. And if they ever used them in an assignment, put a really big red circle around them and go, banned word, banned word. Wasn't I cruel? Now, the reason I banned a series of words in each of my courses was that I wanted my students to think. Because these words, and there are thousands of them, are generalizations. They're broad and overarching beliefs based on a limited amount of evidence, indeed a data set of one, often how you personally think about the world less. Now we all have lazy words, even as researchers, no matter what discipline you're in, you have these lazy words that you throw in and you know there's a whole literature under them, right? And you've thrown it in like we all agree what that word means. You know that thousands of people have thousands of different interpretations of that word. So therefore don't use that word in a way that you think everybody agrees with you because we all know that you don't and an examiner will call you on it every single time. So whatever discipline you're in, think about the words that actually block you doing hard yakka block you doing the intellectual work that you need to do to create a complex, difficult set of meanings. Now, none of us, none of us can use words like globalization, capitalism, neoliberalism. None of us can use words like that now going, we all agree what they mean. There are millions of remarkable and different interpretations of globalization. So we can't use that word thinking everybody agrees with us because they don't. So all these words need to be unpicked and all disciplines have words like this. So ban those words from yourself, acknowledging that they create intellectual shortcuts. They stop you doing the heavy thinking. So get rid of those words and force yourself to express what you really mean. Ooh. Five. Do not manage your insecurity through language. Word choice matters. Erin Falconer demonstrated that word selection makes an incredible difference in daily life. Now, she recommended that we intervene strongly in the relationship between thought and word. She would not agree with my banned list. I understand that. She wouldn't have agreed with the banned stuff. But she came up with a fantastic strategy, and that is a replacement strategy. So here's a word, replace it with something else. So let's talk about that. How do the replacements operate? 
So in other words, if you find that a particular word sets you off, right? If a particular word damages your sense of self or truncates or inhibits your research development, then you know what? Let's do something really simple that's incredibly meaningful. And that is, let's make an active decision to park that word and when that word emerges, replace it with something else. Very simple, powerful strategy. Now, I'll give you a great example of this. Oh, this was brilliant. I'm very impressed with Scott Danner Miller's recommendation. He recommended that we remove the word busy from all our lives. So I agree with Scotty because like when you hear the word busy, I basically want to kill myself. Like, I'm busy. Are you <laughs> busy? Busy? Are you busy? You little bee. You're busy. That's one of my trigger words. When I hear busy, I freak out. So Dana Miller describes that the use of the word busyness in our contemporary society is actually a sickness. So we evaluate people by what they are doing rather than who they are. Oh, yeah. So supposedly if you're busy, you're busy. You're an important person. You're a busy person. You're important. The rest of us that are not busy, we're slack. Okay. So a busy person is supposedly important and valuable. Yeah, right. Whereas I hear the word busy and I just simply think, right, well, you can't plan your day effectively. You know, get yourself organized. So it's about task orientation, time orientation. Do it. Don't talk about it, do it. If you're uh, so busy that you use the word busy, you're not actually busy. So Danny Miller suggested that we get rid of the word busy and replace it with something else. Full. Full. So, he's not busy. He's full. This is just tremendous stuff. So, and of course, full can be fabulous. How are you? I am full. So I'm just going to start doing that. How are you? I'm full. I'm so full. I'm excited. I'm full. So if you think about it, the word busy creates space around it for insecurity. And I think another word that operates like this is critical, right? Now we all know critical thinking, great thing, great literature, no question of the use of the, of the phrase critical thinking. But think about what happens when we cut critical from thinking and we've just got the word critical. Now, there are certain people that really use the word critical in a nasty way. And I'll just give you the phrase. So, I don't mean to be critical, but... Now, we all know what follows the but. I don't mean to be critical, but... Now, we all know something pretty nasty is coming there. So, success is often configured as like a pie. Like, if someone has the pie of success, then, th then there's no pie available for us, right? So if they've got a piece of pie, then they've taken pie off us. That's how success operates. But actually, success is an infinite resource. And there's no need for you to share your definition of success with anybody else. But you've got to have a definition of success. I think we did a vlog about 10 ago on understanding success, right? So you've got to know what success is if you're going to get there. So make sure that you've written that down. What's your understanding of success? Now, just because that's different from other people, not a problem at all. Great, living the dream. So there's no need to be critical of somebody else. Welcome their success. Welcome their success. And of course, that means that you can go on making your own success rather than getting terribly involved in other people's business. Just wish them well, great. That's an amazing achievement. Brilliant. And then get on with your own business. Don't be locked into other people. So if we configure success in this way, then we're going to handle rejection. We're going to handle criticism in a much better way. Now, I am one of those people. I am actually one of those people that argues that every no that we get means that we're closer to a yes. I'm one of those people. So it's like a no doesn't worry me at all. One no, moving me closer to a success. And don't get me wrong, no's hurt, like, oh, that was a no, Ooh, not nice. But my definition of success is you may get knocked down six times, but you get up the seventh time. 
So success for me is getting up the seventh time after you've been knocked down six times. That's my definition of success. So actually, the no is like, I'm moving forward to my success because I was knocked down, but yo, I'm up. I'm up. That's success. Come on. So someone is being critical with you. That's fine. Someone rejected your article. Not a worry. Fine. Because you maintain your definition of success, will create, which will create what is meaningful for you in your life. Now, that, of course, because whatever definition of success you're using, that's why you manage rejection so badly. So your definition of success is not enabling you to manage rejection in your research. So look, a couple of people have said your research is rubbish. Fine, not a worry. So take the disappointment. Take the one rejection, learn from it. But instead of learning from it, going, oh, that, they've made a good point there. They've helped me, that will improve my article. Instead of doing that, you assume that the rejection of the article is a rejection of you as a researcher and you're never going to submit an article again. Maybe academic life is not right for you. Or you know when a supervisor might say, look, the chapter was okay, intro was strong, spine of argument, reasonable, but the conclusion was a bit weak. Now, they've actually gone, that's pretty good. But you didn't hear that's pretty good. You heard it's a bit of a mess and sort of adequate maybe and the conclusion's rubbish. So, of course, what happens is then you magnify the negativity. So I understand how this happens. PhD students, university academics, we're under a huge amount of pressure. So that means that the language we use in the discourse with one another is pretty shocking most of the time. And I've often found the more insignificant an academic feels, the more they use language to prove their own significance by pushing people down. Yeah. So the way to manage your insecurity and the insecurity of others is to enlarge your network of people around you in terms of size, in terms of its quality. Now, I don't like the word network or networking, to be honest with you. You know I don't use that word or that phrase because I like the word relationships a lot. So through my career, I've worked at building relationships, building authentic relationships with colleagues, real, gutsy, granular, meaningful, robust so make these relationships meaningful by supporting others. And you know what? Congratulate them on their success. And it's through this series of meaningful relationships that meaningful communication can emerge. So what begins today with a careful selection of words continues tomorrow with the transformation of our worlds. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.